Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Oh yes, my friends, how deep does the rabbit hole really go? Well, that's what we are here to discover. Dedicated to the only serious choice, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the music, and the spoken word. You're watching Light Source Victory Television Live with me, your host, Pastor J. Sam McCauley, inviting you to sit back and relax for the next 30 minutes or so as we continue our journey into the life-changing, life-giving, everlasting word of the Most High God. My friends, it's time for Bible study. Now, of course, it is my Bible study time that I spend with you. We try and do it each and every Sunday through Thursday right here at accesstv.org and, of course, Facebook, Google+, and YouTube around the world. Broadcasting, of course, live from the greatest city on Earth, Hartford, Connecticut, New England's rising star. So get on the phone, call up friends and family, tell them to tune in, send out your text messages, your tweets, your instant messages, your emails, all of the other things necessary in order to get the message out to whatever social media you use. Instagram, pick the gram, whatever the gram is, get on board. Stick and stay, my friends. Don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. We will be right back. Oh, yeah. All right, my friends, how's it going? Are you doing exceedingly, abundantly, totally, thoroughly well? I hope so. I am. It's been a good day today. Well, you know, my day today was a good day. And the reason I bring that up is because, as I like to always, you know, tell you, uh, whether you're having a good day, bad day, up day, down day, it really doesn't matter, uh, you know, what kind of day you're having, take time out of your day for Bible study. You know, just like if you don't eat, you get depleted, your energy runs out. Well, the same thing happens to your spirit man. If your spirit man doesn't eat, your spirit man will die. Okay? Starve to death. Spiritual starvation. All right? The Bible talks about the fact that we live by the word of God. All right? Not necessarily and only by the, the natural sustenance but also the spiritual sustenance so it's important that you that you uh, intake uh, the good spiritual food necessary in order to uh, maintain your um, your um, your strength in in the gospel of Jesus Christ all right on your TV screen the life-changing life-giving everlasting word of the Most High God you uh, <clears throat> need a Bible in order to participate in this program. If you don't have one, we will, we will provide you with one, as you can see on your viewing screen, whatever the device that you may use is. You can see that the screen is split into two halves. There we go. I was getting some sort of delay, feedback delay, and uh, that was bothering me. Thro throws me off. I I can hear I'm getting a, a a loop feedback somewhere there, but that's all taken care of now. All right. On one side of your viewing screen, whether the, whatever the device you may be using, as you can see highlighted in yellow is the New Living Translation on the other side of your screen, now highlighted in yellow, is the Authorized Version or King James Version. 
The rules of the Bible study are this. We do not do review. It is the expectation of the host, me, that you join us every time that we're on the air and you stay caught up. I'm here. I expect that you'll be here. If you can't be here with me live, then get caught up by watching the Bible study on demand. What you have to do is go to accesstv.org, click on Light Source Ministries, and all of the Bible studies associated with the return to our broadcast will be there up to 100 episodes. All right, so once we get past 100 episodes, uh, the, the last one will drop off of the, you know, playback stream. All right. So at the top of the queue, whenever you go to accesstv.org and click on Light Source Ministries, at the top of the queue will be the last program that we taped, followed by a movie, and then the rest are the, you know, uh, of Light Source Victory Television uh, episodes. You need to click on the fast forward or the next button at the bottom of the screen, and that'll take you, uh, allow you to go through the playlist. All right, and then you can watch... Um, any of the episodes now thus far since we've come back on the air we've taught out of Romans we went from Romans 1 1 all the way to the end and now we are in Ephesians we study for one half hour the half hour begins now so the clock is running let's get started the life-changing life-giving everlasting word of the Most High God Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 once you were dead doomed forever because of your many sins okay because of your many sins and now we have established this at nauseam it is a point that we have been belaboring purposely or on purpose uh, so that the point could be abundantly clear and abundantly made and uh, point being uh, that um, you sin because you are a sinner the thing that proves that you're a sinner or points out the degree of your sin is the law. The law makes it abundantly clear just how much of a sinner you are. Last week, we weren't on the air live because I was on my way to Pennsylvania to see my father. Actually, this time last week, I think we were actually in Pennsylvania visiting my dad. Uh, but uh, on the way back, I think, I can't remember whether it was on the way down, on the way back. I don't remember. But at, at some point in the drive, there was a state trooper. And um, everybody had slowed down. Now, I was in a wave of automobiles moving 85, 80, 85. That's the, that's the auto wave I like to hang in. All right, so we're all rolling down Route 15, doing 85 miles an hour, and then all of a sudden, the traffic just like comes to a, a snail's pace. Like, what in the world is this person up there driving so slow for? Doesn't he know how fast the traffic's going? And, and, and you know, you, you kind of jockey your way trying to move up to the front. Then you can see that this is a Crown Vic. Interceptor. With the little state police lights in there. And so everybody, no one would go past him. So people slow down, they, they slow down, and they pull in behind him. And so he's, he's going down Route 15, and everybody is behind. No one wants to pass him. Now, there are a couple of bold people that kind of like, you know, keep it about maybe five miles an hour faster than he's going. Because as you get closer to him, you look in, and you can see that, well, his wife and kids are in the car. So, you know, he must not be on duty is how folk process that. So then they take a little chance, get a little bolder, and then they put some distance. Uh, but nobody was going to go flying by him because they just weren't known. Now, what did his presence do? His presence, what did his presence do? His presence convicted everybody. 
of the fact that they were speeding. See, he is a representative of, he is the law enforcement officer. His job is to enforce the law. And so when the law enforcer is present, oh, by all means, you're aware that you're, everyone knows they were going over the speed limit. They, they couldn't say to the police, oh, the speed limit isn't 85? I didn't know that. You see, what the law does is it convicts you. Now, where there's no law, there's no sin. There's no missing the mark. Without the law, your sin isn't known. Okay? Sin, right? What is sin? Sin bringeth forth death once it's, once it, once it's executed. So the action. So you are, by your very nature, a sinner. The act proves that you're a sinner, right? So the notion that you can behave your way into heaven by good deeds is a misnomer. By accepting Christ and his completed work on the cross of Calvary, righteousness is credited to you by your faith in what Christ did, all right? And we made that point abundantly clear when we went through Romans, so when we read here in verse 1, once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins, this includes everybody. You're not a good person that's going to get in because you didn't sin today. It says here in verse 2, you, verse 2, top of your screen, you used to live just like the rest of the world. Now, we understand that Ephesians is written to Follow the faithful to the faithful followers of Christ, right? To the faithful followers of Christ, to the saints in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ. So we understand and know that this is written to believers, Christians for lack of a better word, those who have a faithing relationship with Christ the expressed will of God on earth that is the Redeemer, Jesus, the Christ, all right? That's who, who's being addressed here, the people. So it says, you used to live like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince in power of the air, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All right, so it's not until you come into a, a relationship with, with God through Christ that you can even begin to have a mindset that desires to obey God. Until then, you're doing what you want to do, not what God wants. You're in direct opposition to God. Your expressed will is generally in opposition to God's will. That's why you have to submit to the Lord. The Bible talks about presenting your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your, of your mind. Your mind can only be renewed through the Holy Spirit. Verse 3 at the top of your screen. All of us used to live that way, following the passions and desires of our evil nature. We were born with an evil nature. And we were under God's anger just like everyone else. All right, so I think I've made the point abundantly clear in these first three verses that all of us are in a state where without some outside intervention, without God's mercy, we're going to be the recipients of God's wrath. Now that we are saved, that doesn't mean that we are somehow better than. It simply means that we have representation. We are children of the king. We've been adopted into the family of Christ through, through the uh, salvation and the, 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 the redemptive work of the of the blood of the lamb okay verse 4 
But God is rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's special favor that you have been saved. Verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy. And he loved us so very much. Now we understand that mercy is a very specific type of love. We've gone over this several times. We went over this yesterday. Mercy is a very specific type of love. It, in particular, it is a love that is determined by the object. By you or by me. The example we use is the individual that's trying to get in to see Skyfall. He only has a penny. He's $9.99 short of the cost to get in to see the movie. The other individual has $9.99. He is short one cent of the cost necessary to get in to see the movie. Though it's the best James Bond ever, neither one of these people are going to get in to see the movie because they don't have what it takes to get in. They both fall short of the established mark. All right? Well... Mercy is me coming along and providing the relief necessary to push aside their shortfall, their shortcoming, the closing of the gap where they missed the mark. The one needs $9.99, the other needs a penny. I give the one the penny and I give the other one $9.99. Now they are both complete and able to enter in and watch Skyfall. Now, some might say, well, that's not fair. You should give them both $9.99. It's not up to, to you to decide. They have a need. My mercy is providing them. It is a gift. Nothing that they earned, nothing that they deserved. It's not based on who is more capable, who's less capable, who has close to... I am being merciful. But in order to be merciful, I have to have something to be merciful with. I have the money, therefore I can do it. I have the currency. Well, in order for God to be merciful, he has to have something to be merciful with. His love is not enough. The mercy is not enough. There has to be a price paid. So Jesus is the price paid. His blood becomes the currency by which you are purchased by which you are redeemed. So you're purchased back by the completed, finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. And that's why, as we continue to read now, you'll see a very, very important phrase in there that talks about res resurrection. All right? Verse 5. That even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he what raised Christ from the dead. Essential to our salvation is... The resurrection. The Bible says, if Christ be not risen, we of all men are most miserable. Okay? We believe a lie. We preach a lie. We teach a lie. Our hope is flawed because our hope is in that which is not true. It is a lie. So all of salvation rests on the resurrection of Christ. Now, we know he was here. We know he was buried. There's very few people who will argue whether or not Jesus is a historical, actual human figure. The, the, the debate comes in his resurrection and was he the earthly manifestation of God? Now, that's something you have to come to grips with. For me, I, the, the, the argument is settled, all right? And so for us here at Light Source, we move forward with the presupposition that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Messiah, and that he rose from the grave. Now, you have to go out and do your own comparative religious study and all that other kind of stuff so that you don't just blindly jump into something. Because it's not a matter of you blindly jumping in. It's a matter of you having the relationship, the faith, the believing in the completed, finished work of Christ. You don't want to be Christianized. You want to be a Christian. There's a difference. We live in a Christianized country. That doesn't mean everybody in it is a Christian. All right? There's people who believe all kinds of things. All right? You believe in God. Well, you believe that there are only five bullets in the gun. You turn the barrel and pull the trigger. You believe you're going to pull the trigger on the empty barrel. Well, what you believe is irrelevant. What happens is what's relevant. Okay? And so, if 
the scripture be true, if the Bible be true, then you need to have a relationship with the Redeemer. I believe that Christ is that Redeemer, okay? And that's where we move forward. But if Christ be not risen from the grave, then it's all for naught. It's all, it, 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 it's a lie, all right? We put our hope in that which isn't true. We put our hope in that which is, is, is false. And we, and we tell others to, 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 to do the same. So everything hinges on the resurrection of Christ. Because as the Bible makes the point, he is sinless. He is flawless. And death is the penalty for sin. See, we can't pay the price and then get a do-over. It doesn't work that way. Because the penalty for our sin is eternal separation from God. Well, Christ was sinless, so death has no power on him. His death means that there is resurrection from the grave, and now he can credit to us the completed work that he did on the cross because of our faith in him and that relationship with him where we are dependent upon him to be the provider, dependent upon him to be Lord, dependent upon him to be master. We're not dependent upon the government. We're not dependent upon a political party. We're not dependent on a person or a religious philosophy. We're dependent on Jesus and that relationship with him that makes us one with him and thus heirs to the promise that the Father has made. Verse 6 at the top of your screen. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and we are seated with him in the heavenly realms, all because we are one with Christ Jesus. And so God can always point to us as examples of his incredible wealth, of the incredible wealth of his favor and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us through Christ Jesus. Now, I can remember way back sometime here in the, in the Hartford area, there used to be a group called High Noon. And this is the Wayback Machine. And uh, I remember then city treasurer Denise Nampier was a guest speaker. And I remember asking her the difference between wealthy people and rich people. What's the difference? Wealth, rich, you know, you hear wealth, you hear rich, you know, what's, what's the difference? She said, she said, wealth is the difference between what you earn and what you spend. What you earn and what you spend. Okay, wealth. It is the abundance, God's incredible wealth, all right, the incredible wealth of his kindness. It cannot be exhausted. The power of the blood of the lamb shed pays the price for everybody. You can't exhaust God's love. You can't exhaust the mercy of the merciful aspect of God's love. You can't exhaust his willingness to do for you that which is necessary. He can't. Because it was expressed while you were yet sinners, while you were yet separated from him, while you were in a state of eternal damnation. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. While you were while you were nigh unto being judged and found wanting and thus would be in a state of eternal damnation, God died for you, all right? Put on a tent of human flesh, shed life's precious blood for you. So if he did that when you were a sinner, when you were lost, how much more now that you've come to him is he going to make sure that the things that you have need of will be provided? That's the God you serve all right so verse 7 God can always point to us as examples of his incredible wealth 
verse 7 out of the King James puts it this way, uh, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith and not and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works least any man should boast verse 7 out of the New Living Translation being joined by my daughter tonight she just came in here like a vapor all of a sudden I turned around and she was there I don't know if you can see her over there scratching her scratching her knee wave to the people seven I just wave right here see move over honey so they can see you there she is mm -hmm. bless her little heart that's my little seven my wife is also joining us tonight hello wife I won't turn the camera on you she's sitting in a place there's one, two, three, four, five. We have five cameras in this studio, and she is in a strategic place where none of them could become live and be positioned to her. Well, one we could probably position. You, you didn't. Right. But see, the power, there is a power to which every man must answer, the wife. And I know better than to put her on camera when she's expressed her will that that not be done. Mm -hmm. Okay, I digress. Let us continue being joined by two beautiful women tonight. Okay, the third one is upstairs sleep. You should be upstairs sleep, but we'll let that go for now. No better place to be than Bible study. All right, that's one thing you can do. You can get up and come down here for Bible study, even if you are three. There you go. She came in, was quiet, wasn't making any noise, not disruptive. She knows. All right, I'm sorry, my friends. I, I digress. Let's continue. So, verse 7 out of the New Living Translation, reading out of Ephesians chapter 2. And so God can always point to us as examples of his incredible wealth, of the incredible wealth of his favor and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us through Christ Jesus. God saved you by his special favor or grace when you what? Faithed, when you believed. When you put your faith and trust in him, then by that act, God extended to you salvation. There's nothing you did to work for. You didn't do any work. And you can't take credit for this, the Bible says. It is a gift from God. Gift from God. All right, this is not something you did. You, you can't take credit for it like you've done, you know, uh, you climbed 10,000 flights of stairs on bent knee and your knees were blown out because of it, your piousness and you gave money to the poor and you fed hungry children and you cooked chicken dinners every Thanksgiving and, you know, you worked in the food distribution pantry and, and now God is somehow going to look the other way from all the rest of the evil you've done. It doesn't work that way. You can't, you can't bribe God, all right? And so what he's looking for is your relationship with him whereby you become kin to he who is perfect and righteous. And so without the kinsmen to redeem you through that type of relationship, salvation becomes a logistical impossibility i mean if you want to look at it that way okay so no matter how you look at it it is it's essential and necessary for the messiah to be present in your life god saved you by his special favor when you believed and you can't take credit for this it is the gift it is a gift one more time it is a gift from God verse 9 salvation is not a reward it's not my opinion that's what the word says 
This is why I get such a, a kick out of people saying otherwise. I mean, God's word is forever settled. And, you know, you may not like what it says, and you don't have to like what it says. But you liking it or not liking it doesn't, doesn't change it. All right? It says salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Verse 9 out of the King James. Not of works, least any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Verse 10 out of the New Living Translation. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the things, the good things he planned for us long ago. So the good things you do are the result of the indwelling spirit of God in the purchased possession, you, purchased by the blood of the lamb. All right, so you are... You are, you are saved by grace. You have a relationship with Jesus. And now there's going to be an outward manifestation of that relationship that is reflected in the good works. It isn't the good works that you do that get you salvation. It's the fact that you're saved that causes you to do the good works. And then where James comes in, faith without works is dead. All right? The work becomes dead the evidence of the faith. Just like faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of your hope is the faith. What is your hope in? You can tell a person's hope by their work. Just like you can tell a tree by their fruit. Okay? Good trees don't produce bad fruit and bad trees don't produce good fruit. The works of the flesh are one thing, the works of the Spirit are another. You cannot demonstrate the work of the Spirit without having the Spirit. Okay, so if you have faith in getting to the moon, then the work will be that of getting to the moon. If you have faith in getting to Mars, then the work's going to be that of getting to Mars. What you have faith in hope, what, excuse me, if you have hope in, then the, the work is going to be demonstrated in where your hope is. The faith is the, man, is the outward manifestation of the energy directed toward accomplishing what you have hope in. Once you receive that which you hope for, you no longer work for it. Okay? So if you're trying to get hired by ESPN, okay, once you get the job, you're not going to keep going to the employment office asking them for a job. You, you have the job. Okay, so... Our hope is in Christ. Now, we've received the Holy Spirit, which is a down payment on the purchased possession, but until we actually are translated and are in glory, either through the rapture or through the death of, of this physical plant, you're not arrived. Though paradoxically, you are seated in heavenly places. All right? So you don't have to hope for salvation that you've already received. But you do hope for the time when you are in the presence enjoying the glory of God. Amen? Amen. All right, my friends, with that, I think that's where we'll end today. We're, we're, we're out of time. <sighs> Half hour just doesn't seem like enough time. But, but it is. Because if we talk for three hours, at some point it becomes mind-numbing. All right? There's enough there for you to now go and meditate. To think on these things. To search the scriptures. To see whether or not what I said was so. If it lines up with scripture, take it, run with it, grow with it. If it doesn't line up, then that means I'm wrong and you need to let me know. So that I can be corrected. All right? 
My friends, when it's all said and done, the only thing you need to know is this fact, and that is, of course, that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He alone saves and changes lives. Won't you call on his name today? Allow him to be Lord of your life. If you've already called on Jesus to be Lord of your life, you have an obligation to go out and tell others about God's saving grace and the wonderful, merciful power of his love. We'll see you real soon. Be back Sunday night. Do it all once again. Another week ahead. Enjoy your weekend. Have a good one. God bless you. Bye-bye. Okay.